Uh, welcome to the talk called Introduction to Hardware Efficiency. And uh, let me put it via show. So it's called Introduction to Hardware Efficiency. And it's, I talk to developers and help them help them improve hardware efficiency. So I'm Ivica Bogosavljevic. I specialize in software performance in C and C++. And software performance comes in many shapes and sizes. And some of them is more familiar to you, like you try to reduce the number of steps that your algorithm is doing, or maybe you're using the programming language a bit differently. So it's it's um, you're using it more, more efficiently. But one of the really important parts of software optimization is also hardware efficiency. That means uh, utilizing hardware in the best, best possible way. So you get the most uh, bang for the buck. So the, you, you utilize the hardware that is, is uh, as, as, as fast as possible. I work uh, I work as a software, I debug these kind of problems for customers who have problems with software performance and also I do performance training. So if your company has this problem with software performance and I give training so I can help you debug them. Okay, so we, tonight we talk about hardware efficiency and hardware efficiency is important and we'll see with a lot of examples and techniques and things that you can use, you will see why is it important, how is it important, especially for peak performance. So if you have, for example, some algorithms that are executed many, many times, or the practical algorithm in that domain would be, would be uh, matrix multiplication, which is part of machine learning, or vector, vector, vector matrix multiplication. So you want these algorithms to be like perfectly hardware efficient and also minimum number of instructions. So uh, when you make it like that, then then you get to you get to an algorithm that is perfect in every sense. Okay, so hardware efficiency has two major bottlenecks. There are more of them, but two are major and they come up more most of, common in your software. So one is that, so what is the main part of the computer system? It has a CPU, it has a memory, and data flows between CPU and memory. And the CPU depends on the memory. So it has to wait for the data to come before it can execute anything. So if you in your in your in your code, you have two types of two basic big type groups of, 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 of hardware bottlenecks. One is the bottleneck in the CPU. When you don't, when data is there, but you don't have enough resources to process it, and second bottleneck is a bottleneck where you have enough CPU resources, but data is not there, so you're waiting for data. Also, one additional bottleneck, which is not so related to to the resources, neither to CPU and memory, it's called the uh, instruction level parallelism bottleneck. So this is like the bottleneck that is a property of your code. So um, it will limit the, 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 the program speed regardless of the available hardware resources. And it's actually dependent on, uh, it's, it's the, the reason why it exists are instruction dependencies. You cannot move and execute further operations in your program until you have completed previous iterations. So there is this dependency chain and this actually can severely limit. I will see that later. Now, why did I introduce this kind of division is because uh, every type of these problems is solved differently. So computational intensive codes, which are also core bound because they're limited by core, core, core resources, they're, they're fixed in one way, but memory intensive codes, they're fixed in different way. And instruction level parallelism uh, bound codes that uh, are, are fixed in another way. Uh, okay. So during the talk, if you happen to have any questions, feel free to ask. And also during the talk, I will ask questions to you because I have like prepared a few quizzes. And I think it will be fun. <laughs> why, 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 why the laugh? It, it won't be difficult. It will be fun. So, how do you know if your code is computationally intensive or memory intensive? So, it, does it depend more on memory resources or does it depend more on computational resources in CPU? Well, there are two basic approaches. One is code inspection. So, you take a look at your code and see, huh, this could be more computational intensive. Or we have a dedicated tool. Such tool is this Intel Vtune or AMD Microprof, PMU Tools, Liquid, which is developed here in Erlangen, uh, to read hardware performance counters and then calculate some statistics about code that will tell you if your code is more computationally bound or memory bound. Now you take this tool and you create a, take a snapshot 
uh, record your what your program is doing and then you get certain numbers and it looks something like this okay so if you look at here uh, if you look at here sorry sorry so if you look at this is the snapshot from Intel Vitium and here on the left side you see functions and there is this call called instructions retire that means how many instructions did this function execute and you want to monitor this because when you if you're fixing a code and instruction counter goes down that means you're becoming more you need less instructions to complete something should be in principle should be faster one really important metric is called cpi meaning cycles per instructions so modern cpus can execute more than one instruction in a single cycle so let's say intel x x64 cpus can process four cycles four instructions per cycle so the perfect cycle per instruction would be uh, 0.25. If you have a like 0.25 CPI as a metric, that means that your program is perfectly memory efficient, uh, hardware efficient. But don't be fooled because hardware efficiency doesn't necessarily mean fast program. For example, if you compile your program with those zero, without any optimizations, you will be probably more hardware efficient. <laughs> that doesn't make sense, but you have more instructions that don't depend on one another. Okay. So look at this. So we have here four columns called front end bound, bad speculation, memory bound, and core bound. And these two, this memory bound means that if you see the large percentage of this column, that means this, this code is mostly memory bound. And then you should apply some of the techniques used to fix memory bound code. On the other hand, you see the third function in this table is core bound because it has a bigger number here. These two are most common, memory bound and core bound, and this front end bound and bad speculation, they don't come up that often. So I won't talk with them, talk about them this evening. Okay, questions? Yes? What's the question for? It wait the 64% of the time? No, it's a uh, number of uh, lost slots, uh, uh, number of, uh, number, let's say, there are total and slots. And the CPU was like using this percentage, uh, uh, this and the other one were wasted. Like it was executing four instructions per cycle, but it was in reality it was executing 3.2 or 1.7. So these are the you should read the documentation of the video to see exactly what does it mean because it changes a bit context context change depending on on the application. Okay, more questions? Yes. So, uh, I have two questions. The first one. This tool is related to programs that are designed for Intel CPUs, right? Yes, so this tool works only on Intel CPUs. Although the, the it is good when you're debugging, so you will debug on Intel CPUs, but normally the fixes that you do will also apply to other architectures, including ARM and uh, AMD. Um, you would need to run it on an Intel. It's a runtime tool. It, it gathers data from runtime. Target should be an Intel. Yeah, target should be an Intel CPU. Intel, but not AMD, Intel. Yes, yes. Okay. Do you have a visualization for like such code tools for cross compiler? That is a really difficult question. There is another tool that supports AMD and ARM, but Intel is more uh, user friendly, so that's why I'm presenting it first. First. So normally the way I do is I would just compile it for Intel and do the analysis there. And then normally this also, the, the techniques also translate to other architectures as well. Okay. Yes. So are instruction bound problems a variant of core bound problems? Or are they completely different? Instruction level parallelism bound. Yes. Yeah, they are, okay, so this, the, the tool itself won't tell you if it's instruction level parallelism bound. But when we go about you will figure out it's not that you can look at the code and figure out if it's instruction level parallelism bound. Uh, the tools don't tell you, they will put it probably in the core category if, if it's uh, bound, if there are dependency in calculations or memory bound if there are dependency in loads. But they won't tell you exactly. That's, that is the downside of this tool. That's the downside of, the downside of this. What's, the, what's the, the main difference between core bound uh -huh. and instruction? Yeah. Instruction level, uh, core bound, it means I don't have enough CPU resources. And it's structural level bound. That means that I have enough resources, but I cannot good, put a good use to them. I need to wait 
Uh, this instruction cannot be executed because it needs to wait for data from a previous instruction which is not yet completed. Uh, let me give you an example. Imagine a linked list, okay? Imagine an array and you're iterating or calculating some of arrays. And then imagine a linked list, you're iterating a linked list. You cannot move to process the next element of the list until you've completed the current one. Why? Because you need to load the data to get the address of the next. With array, you don't have that problem. You can actually go, with, you don't have that problem that you don't know what's the next value, what is the next address of the next element. So we'll talk about that when it comes, so it will be clear, don't worry. Okay, more questions? Okay, repeat the question. Aha, uh -huh. okay. Okay, okay. So another tool is called Liquid. It's developed here at London. Uh, it has some good things about it. it it measures uh, CPU, it reads uh, hardware performance counters. It will tell you this CPI instruction, instruction uh, count, instruction count, these retired instructions, CPU clock, and halt, and so on. So it's a good tool. Uh, the Intel is more user friendly, but this one works on other architectures as well. You can read, for example, many things, like uh, you can read how much the power consumption, you can read the uh, you can read how much megabyte was transferred between the CPU and megabyte in and, and uh, L1 cache or 2 cache and so on. So it, it's really powerful tool, but it's um, more expert-like. So it's not as easy as Win to retune. Okay. Uh, yes. I've seen you used uh, CPI most of the time uh -huh. because of course there's the inverse metric of instructions because might be yes. um, what's your preference of using one of the other? The tools before CPI. IPC, but all the tools report CPI. So there is an inverse instruction IPC, instructions per cycle, and the perfect value is four, but no, you, you don't see any tools reporting it. Okay. Uh, so you you have your code and you're playing something with hardware efficiency. How do you do? So what do you do? Well, first you move that part of the code inside a separate function because the tools work on function level. That's one thing. Uh, you what you're observing, instruction count, number of executed retired instructions, cycle count, which is corresponds to time, and cycle per instruction. And then you will see if the CPI metric is going down or up, are you becoming more or less hardware efficient? If the number of executed instructions stay the same and you're becoming less hardware efficient, more hardware efficient, the runtime will be faster. Uh, so sometimes you will normally when you say I'm I'm making my software faster, what you're actually saying, I'm I need less instructions to complete something. But in my case, it can actually mean you I'm doing more instructions to complete something, but I'm more hardware efficient. I do it in less cycles because the CPU can process four cycles per instruction. Okay, so if the tool is showing that the code is mostly core bound. We'll talk about it. If it shows mem mostly memory bound, we'll talk about it as well. Okay, so moving to the first part, optimizing computational intensive codes. The first question is, I told you you can use tools to, to, to figure out if your code is computational intensive or memory intensive, but you can also do it through code inspection. So the old way, just look at the code and to figure out. And it's actually quite simple because the, most codes are memory, memory bound, memory intensive. So imagine you have your for loop that is doing some kind of processing. So if it is processing simple data types, integer, charge, double, float, so really small classes, and this data is stored in an array or a vector, so it's continuous in memory, in a block of memory, and you're, you're iterating going from one side to another. So you're not skipping elements, you're not performing random accesses to array. And if all these three conditions are uh, true, then this could be probably be computational intensive. It will depend on CPU on CPU uh, resources. If any of these, so even one, if not, if it's it's not true, then the code will probably go to the memory intensive side. Okay, so computational intensive codes you have them, they're executed by the CPU a lot, like image processing algorithms are often uh, computationally intensive, like converting image from one type to another type, machine learning algorithms which do linear algebra, telecommunication, scientific computing, this kind of image, this kind of algorithms that work with floats, with integers, that do work on arrays and they they, they they go from array from one to another side that most of them are computationally intensive. Uh, but 
some of them are not. Now we have a quiz. Is it computational intensive or memory intensive? So this is the first the first question. It's a hash set lookup. So you have this uh, hash set. There is a value, and this is a hash set vector. Okay, and you calculate the hash, which is the entry into the hash set, and then returning true if hash set of hash equals equals value. So imagine you do this in a for loop. Would this code be computationally intensive or memory intensive? Why? Yes. So this one hash set of hash is jumping around memory. Sorry. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's dominantly, and the code is not either or. So it is, is as you saw the percentages. Code can be like seventy percent this one and thirty percent another type. So it's not or or. It's just the the most. What's the most? Okay. Yes. Yes. If the hash set is really really small, it uh, will probably pick the, the the fastest data cache, so it will be computationally intensive, and that's the reason that's the reason why it is. Uh, so I brought it here. If it's really small, so if it's the fast, fastest data cache, the the code be computationally intensive. So you should also also always measure, but you should get the, develop some kind of intuition for these things. Question number two. First vector in a vector of strings. We have a vector of strings here, and we have a for loop, and it, it, it iterates through a vector of strings and it checks the first letter and puts it in a vector of chars. So this loop, is it memory intensive or is it computational intensive? What do you think? Both. Yes, both. both, but dominantly, let's say. Huh? Okay. Okay, let's say the strings are like, 15 characters. <laughs> Sorry, oh, no, 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 this is an error. Sorry, this is an error. This is not correct. No, that doesn't compile. But it was, you You understand the, the intention here. They're all the same string? Like, they're all reference to the same string? No, no, no. The, if we have a vector of strings, random string, John. Different yeah, different strings. Yeah. Not a, like a common, common, not some weird case, like a really common case. <laughs> Sorry? Yes. No, just one. It's called once. So it's a vector of strings. Like all the all the employees in this company. Yeah. So there, there, there are several things, but this code will probably be memory intensive most of the time. First, the thing is that the string class has a pointer most of the time, not always. So the string class has a pointer to keep allocated objects and you don't know its address beforehand. That's one thing. But even if there is this small string optimization and all your strings are small, the class set to this string is not like a small class. It has like, let's say, how many bytes? I think like 32 or something like that. It has that many bytes. So it's, it, it is what you're actually processing uh, larger classes. So this code will probably be memory intensive. Okay, uh, next question. So complex number multiplication. So we have a vector of com Yes? Sorry? Wait, I didn't finish my sentence. <laughs> okay, so we have a vector of complex numbers and we have a V2, which is a, like a, just a regular number. And then we multiply the, we have the result, which is again vector of uh, complex numbers, and then we are now calculating. We are pushing into this vector v1 times real. So we are multiplying scalar with the vector with the complex number. So the simple, simple real number with the complex number. Okay. So the question is, would this be computationally intensive? Why? Yeah, so the reason why, yes, it is computational intensive, and the reason it's really simple, it fills the old, uh, fulfills all these three conditions. It is processing uh, arrays, uh, it's processing small classes or simple types, and it goes sequentially from zero to n. Yes? The problem is actually is to do cache stretching with size. No, sorry, I don't know. You always accept the V1 size. 
that's a problem because you you go to the heap if you set the one one data in the array and then you go back to the the, the, the members begin and end and sub, and subtract them. All. I don't understand what you mean. The one dot size should be taken outside of the loop. Yes. No, no the, the compiler normally should be able to remove this as a loop in very con motion moves outside of the loop. If it's a constant. No, it's not constant and it's so uh, okay so what you're saying is that this v1 size the compiler will ask at any time will be repeatedly loading data but the prop okay let's even that if that does happen but it shouldn't happen the compiler should be smart enough to remove this and figure out that the size is constant that v1 doesn't change you don't have to specify it with const if it knows that v1 doesn't change it will it can do that kind of optimizations it does that that's the basic of compiler optimization is looping variant from motion. Okay, okay. I mean, but nevertheless, the 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 access to the data is uh, uh, the the it is still CPU, it is still core bound. It's not memory bound, even if that's true. Yes. Sorry. Like I think you want to access the elements of the one that you are. Yes. Sorry. Sorry, it, I, I didn't compile this. Yes, you're right. I didn't. No, no, I was doing. I was creating quiz. I didn't. I didn't run through a compiler, and I, I should do that because it's a second error. Yes. Yes. So normally, uh, so yes, and that's why you should use the tools. And but this is made to develop intuition about things. This kind of code will be typically when you measure them, they will be typically computationally bound. Although you can always expect surprises. That's not uncommon. Yes. Tricky part is like, how do you separate like, you have a complex memory subsystem and like if you're talking about DRAM access, okay, this is not DRAM access bound probably, but like if you're talking about L1 cache. Bandwidth bound, probably this is one L1 cache bound. Yeah, yeah. So, like, how do you separate memory? Because I think what you the, said the, is probably okay. main memory. Right? So, the tools itself, I'm talking about memory bound and not introducing additional complex stuff. But what I'm doing is that uh, um, uh, the tools can tell you is it L1 cache bound, L2 cache bound, DRAM bound, and so on. So, the tools, the VQ has that ability. Okay? Yes? You were just basically saying the compiler explorer. Maybe there be some kind of metric that you say with a lot of registry operations and maybe the CPU bound so it has a lot of memory. Yeah, if you compile it with those zero, then if you become computationally bound. <laughs> the, 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 the ideas of hardware efficiency. So it's not the idea that I'm tricking the compiler to do. This is what I would expect when I compile my code with enough optimizations for three. Okay. Okay, more questions? Okay, uh, so complex T is relatively small. We have simple data accesses, sequential accesses, uh, simple data type sequential accesses, and and uh, we have going uh, uh, data stored in arrays, so probably computationally long. Uh, okay, naive matrix multiplication. Okay, let's just give just let me just give you a few 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 uh, few information about this. So uh, a bit of background. So matrices in C and C++ are stored row wise. So the matrix is one dimensional. It's just one dimension, and you have a uh, data you have a data structure that is two dimensional. So, uh, sorry, the last row. Can you keep it down? Can you keep it down? Thank you. <laughs> so you have a matrix that is two-dimensional and the memory is one-dimensional and uh, you need to store it in a one-dimensional memory and you store it row by row. Okay, so this is the first row and this is the second row and this is the third row. Okay, now this is the three nested loops and this is how matrix multiplication called naive like the textbook implementation and we have A, B and C. Now the question is is this uh, computationally bound or memory bound? 
to do to un, to figure out if it's computational bound or memory bound, you need to do like memory access analysis. So we know that A, B, and C are simple data types. Okay. Now the question is, are the memory accesses sequential or is it jumping around memory? So what do you think? Is A sorry? Well, it floats or doubles, doesn't matter. Simple data types. So the matrices are stored in memory as arrays. So like this. So like this here. Sorry? You need to analyze. You need to analyze what is the access pattern for A. Let's say uh, let's analyze. A of I K. A of I K. So what happens when the innermost loop increases by one? This moves to what? Next, yeah. so it's the crunch It's like you have an array and you're just moving one by one, okay? And let's say C of IJ, what kind of access is that? It's not sequential. Look, the loop K increases by one. What kind of access is that? C of IK, IJ. It's same, it's only hitting the same memory address. But like for the other but we're looking always in the inner loop because the inner loop the, the changes. Okay, so it's constant. Yes? Yes, it will, the compiler will typically be able to move this, not even use memory allocation for this, it will just hold this value in register. Okay, but it's a constant that's access. It will just access the same value over and over. But this B of KJ, what what about it? What kind of memory access type is that one? So what happens when K increases by one? Yes. 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 So it would go. It would like goes zero zero, then go to one zero, then go to two zero. Yeah, it's jumping. So if the matrix is small, it will be computational intensive. That's clear. But if the matrix is large enough, this will be memory intensive. So this is called naive mat ma matrix multiplication. And check this one out. Okay, the, the fifth one is interchanged. So what happened here? Uh, I exchanged the exchange the 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 uh, exchange the outer loop and the uh, the middle loop and the innermost loop. So the loop is now a J. So what happens now? What what has changed? With regards to access pattern of A, B, and C. Okay, the access pattern of A is what kind? What type? Constant. Constant. B? Yeah, B and C are sequential, and A is constant, and this, this code is actually, yes, it's a uh, computational intensive. So, yes. So, uh, let's, yes. I'm not sure, but I'm interested in like one market because like three factors are pretty smart. Not that smart. Are you sure? Yes. I'm 100% sure. I do that all, I do this stuff all day. <laughs> uh, sorry? I only saw that, I, I saw once in the compiler that it actually, the Intel's compiler did this optimization manual in the compiler itself. I never saw it. See, GCC and Clang, I never saw that. They have a, a loop interchange pass. This is how it's called. But I, I, I think it, they didn't think it's enabled by default. We need to specify. Yes? Aha. Uh -huh. But it's like a special case. It's a special case, and they just try to catch that one and optimize it specifically. OK, OK, OK. So uh, sometimes it's possible to apply some kind of uh, transformation in your code to convert them from uh, memory bound to computationally bound. And uh, in most cases, it is better to be computationally intensive because computation CPUs are much faster than memory. It is much faster to process data and then to fetch it. Okay. For example, if you need two values, one is X and the other one is X plus one, you can either call those, getting them from the fastest cache takes three cycles and calculating just increasing the register by one takes almost zero cycles or one cycle let's say because arithmetic is faster than, than data loading 
So generally, generally, even for the fastest data, uh, data caches, uh, loading is slower than the alternatives. Okay, so the thing that I talked about, the name and the interchange matrix multiplication, this, uh, this optimization is called loop interchange, and it is exchanging the outer loop becomes the inner, the inner becomes the outer, and after loop interchange, in all cases, you saw that all the arrays are accessed sequentially. And with matrix mm -hmm. size, the original took one, uh, with matrix size 1200 times 1200, the first loop takes 5.8 seconds, the second loop takes 1.22 seconds. Okay, so it's uh, around three or four times speed up. Okay, a second way to fix memory intensive code is called structure of arrays. And actually, what the, it's really simple. So imagine you have a class student and he has like string name and average mark, and then you have here vector of student and you want to convert it to structure of array. This one is called array of structures because it's a std vector is array of structures which are classes. So it's a terminology left over from C. When you convert them to structure of arrays you have a class students so it's a plural and inside you have a, a one vector for names and one vector for average numbers. And when I did this calculated calculating the average mark of all students so this, it just touches the average mark. Original took one, 194 milliseconds, and the modified version took 42 milliseconds. And the reason is why, because this modified version is computational intensive. Why? Because it just acts as arrays, simple types, sequentially. So this is vector of doubles I'm calculating on that. Okay. Uh, questions? If you want to find the name, the right one should be very good, or because I have to go through the name, and then we can program the next to the left one. So normally, normally the right one would be better in most, even when you just access its names, because again you are decreasing the class size, so the, the, you have like smaller type, and uh, this this if, even if you only access names, it will be faster. Yes. <laughs> yes. Sorry, what types? Plain. Because for me personally, because of the strength, maybe we don't know the pipe size, that's why it is a bit of it's not able to optimize it. If we know, we can statically say that this is the size of my struct, then I don't think there should be any difference between the two. I, 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 I don't, sorry, I just don't understand what. I think uh, it was just double instead of string. I personally feel the runtime will be the same. So it's a, it's a, you'll see later as the talk develops that it's not an easy, there is no answer yes or no. So the answer is really depending on what type of, if you have like a struct and you have two floats, two doubles, whatever, and you access both of them, then this, the left one or the right one will probably be the same in regards to the performance. But if you have, uh, a struct where you access only one member and not the other one, then you will see that it's not like that. Okay? Because, because when, when it comes to performance, it's important how you access data and how it's laid out in memory. Everything is actually important, okay? Okay. Okay, now I want to introduce vectorization. How many people have heard of it? Oh, oh nice. That's, that's nice. Okay. So, it's really simple. So most modern CPUs, especially those using servers and desktop and in uh, embedded system, but not like the microcontroller types, like Cortex A has these vectorization units, and they can process more than one piece of data in one instruction. So you have instructions that, for example, can load four floats from memory into a special vector register and hold four floats, and then adds two pairs of four floats together to produce four results. And then it can, in one instruction, store that for results to, to, to memory. 
cortex I don't know about cortex M. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Um, and uh, the idea is here if um, the compilers also support this, it's called auto vectorization. When they take your loop on the left, you see AFI equals BFI time plus the CFI. The compiler performs auto vectorization and you get like loading four integers into a BTMP register, loading four uh, floats, let's say, into CTMP, adding them together and then storing four results on array. And this is what actually happens under the cover when the loop is vectorized, okay? Uh, vectorized code runs several times faster. So normally two, three, four, five, depends on the application, yes? No, this is, this is pseudo assembly. This is not real code. This is what I wrote. But it, uh, for educational purposes, it's nice because it's really, you, you easily see what happens. There is this uh, repository called Awesome Sim, and they have. I saw that there is a like a sim visualization tool. I didn't try it, so they have it. Okay, so vector is could run several times faster. The number of values that you can process in one instruction is called number of lanes. So imagine a highway; it has four lanes, and you can have four parallel cars running on it. And th this is the image you would you should have. Uh, uh, in your head. Now the compilers, when the correct compiler flags are given, like optimization level three, and maybe some other compilation flags will can op auto automatically optimize certain types of loops, but not have anything. Uh, you can check if the compiler has vectorized your uh, loop, and this is the flags you will, that you will be using. So R pass on Clang and F opting for that call on GCC. So you use two flags and you will print. Clang generally has a better optimization report because it will report also, uh, it will tell you if uh, what you need to do to fix vectorization problems. Sometimes that's also possible. So, okay, question, yes? Sorry? Microsoft also has a report, but Microsoft, uh, with regards to this compilation option, they are much, 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 um, how should I say, modest. They don't give a lot of, they, I saw that they have this report and also they, give some error numbers why a certain loop is not vectorized, and you can try it out and see if it fits. But as far as I know, uh, on my Windows, there is Clang CL for, for Windows, and you can use Clangs also there. Clang is really good, actually, okay? Questions? Okay, I hope you're having fun, I am. <laughs> <laughs> so what are the prerequisites for auto vectorization? What what are the, the prerequisites that your loop will be vectorized by the compiler automatically? First, simple data types. Again, the integer, char, double, floats, or small classes. And the reason is because if that not the case, the compiler will think that the loop is memory intensive, it will just skip the vectorization. It will say this doesn't pay off. Next is good memory access pattern. Again, sequential accesses, constant accesses are fine. Jumping around memory, not so. Next thing with vectorizations, you want to have independent iterations. So you don't want to have loop carry dependencies. Loop carry dependencies is then what does it mean? Is that in the current iteration, I need data from the previous iteration. That means that loop can run only in one direction. You cannot change the direction. You cannot run the loop in any direction. And this loop carry dependency is a really limiting factor. This is the essential problem of vectorization. Some, some loops cannot be vectorized because of it. Next thing, the loop needs to be countable. So some, some loops the compilers won't vectorize, like a while loop which searches if there is a certain character in the string. It's not countable because the, you don't know the number of iterations before the loop starts. Countable means that you know the number of iterations before the loop starts. So a for loop which has i going from n till n and m and then don't change during the execution is countable loop. So ma many loops are countable. Yes? So let's say you're going to compute the big program, but the iterates are fits, and you plot the data before fits, uh -huh. or first try seed. Uh, in your practice, is it better to first try seed? You can do both. You can have both. You can have within uh, each thread, you have vectorized code in threads. That's possible. They don't exclude one another. Okay? Um, next thing is related, you, you should, the loop should not have conditionals, like if nested conditional switches and so on, because if it has it, that decreases the, the efficiency of vectorization. 
uh, will be too long to go, but just remember that if it has a lot of conditional, just the compiler optimization report will tell you it has many conditionals. Uh, one thing is also no pointer aliasing, so pointer aliasing introduces like false dependence, uh, like dependencies, uh, and when there's pointer aliasing, then those loops don't compile because they don't have independent iterations. You need to have correct compilation flags, so O3 or O2 on Clang, O3 on GCC. Uh, for some loops, also additional like associative mass. Uh, and you should not have fault to external functions, so non-inlineable functions. If the compiler manages to inline function, it can vectorize it, but if it cannot, then those loops are typically not vectorized. Okay, want to do another round? <laughs> uh, okay, so this is again, is this loop vectorizable automatically by the compiler or not? No. Yeah, no, sorry, this loop inside the loop. No, why? Sorry? So it's the same, the hash set lookup, it's the same example we have earlier. It was it computational or memory intensive? And we said it was memory intensive, and the compiler won't vectorize because it's memory intensive. According to its cost model inside the compiler, it will it will assume that this loop would, would not profit from vectorization and will not do it. Okay? Yes? Could you do a CIMD, um, indexing? And you can, you can, uh, ABX, so we're going now into details, but uh, modern uh, Intel and x64 CPUs now, AMD and Intel have this instruction that can load data not from consecutive, but from various, from random. They can load four data, but the four pieces of data into one vector register. And this actually works. But it won't be efficient because if the data if the if the data set is large. So these getters don't pay they, they're called gathering instructions, so they gather data and they don't pay off if 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 the data set is too large. And by too large not not necessarily a lot like one megabyte, it's already too large. Okay, so memory intensive codes don't vector as well. And the compiler of it. Partition is quick sort. Okay, this is partition. Uh, in quick sort. Now imagine this T is a simple type. T is a simple type. And this is the hot loop. Will, would the compiler vectorize this loop or not? Why? Oh, too many conditionals are problem. Some conditionals are fine. Okay. But it's not if. Something else. Yes, you have dependency on i because you uh, the, the value of i in the current iteration depends on the previous iteration. I value of i is not predictable. You don't know how it will develop. It can be zero and sometimes it can be increased, so that's the, the, the reason why it won't vectorize. Uh, the loop find min max. So this is a loop which is finding minimum and maximum in a in a in a uh, uh -huh. Yeah, so yes, this, there is a loop carry dependence here, but there is a trick how to vectorize this thing. Huh? No, let me explain to you. So it's so it, it, the same way, imagine that we have a for loop that just sums sums all the elements of a vector into a one variable. It's called a reduction loop. So what actually, when this loop is vectorizable by the compiler, but it's because the compiler recognizes the pattern. It recognizes the pattern. It holds four. So it has, look at here. So it has, in this register, hold four minimums. So it loads four pieces of data and finds four minimums. Then it force, loads another four pieces of data and find, uh, uh, it has four another minimums. And so it, it repeats. And at the end, it has four minimums, and one of them is the true minimum. It, it, the end, there is this reduction step. Okay, so this is how the compiler vectorizes, for example, summing to a, to a, to a, to a, if you have a loop that's summing. I think I should rewrite this a bit more to be clear. Yes, it has the back uh, max is like you just compare it to the just compare instruction. There is a compare instruction uh, that takes two vectors. 
all all of them. So if the compiler does not have seen the extension, that then if you run that code, it will crash. If there are no instructions. But you, you understand what I'm, what I mean, okay? Yes. 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 Also, plus and multiply also work for the same reasons. Plus, uh, plus, multiplication, addition, minimum and maximum are associative and yes. That works. That works if you relax the floating point precision. So if you say if you specify fast math on that compilation flag, that works also. Huh? Yes. I was joking. I said they should call this flag wrong math. <laughs> yeah, for uh, for uh, vectorizing this kind of loop, you need to have on the command line not only of three. You need to have f associative math if you are having floating points, and you have plus or or, or multiplication. The compiler won't vectorize without it, and you you can expect slight changes in result. Okay. A for loop with break. So we have a for loop here going over char, and if it finds a char. Then it breaks, it goes out. Is this vectorizable by the compiler or not? Sorry? Yes, it's uncountable. So the, the compiler doesn't know when, when uh, the, the, the loop is uncountable, means the number of iterations cannot be counted in advance and the compilers cannot automatically vectorize those loops. But you can do it manually. Yes? I think you should be able to do this because it knows the loop as an upper bound. Mm -hmm. And it can do like CD comparisons with the mask. So yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I, I would expect that, but in my what I what I've seen is that they don't do that. But maybe if you experiment, send me an email. I'm just curious if you see. I, I didn't see that this kind of loop is actually vectorized. Mm -hmm. uh, and final question is processing STD vector of strings. So we have a vector of strings. And this is the reduction loop. So result plus equals VFI that size. Now the question is: this loop vectorizable or not? Why? So this loop is vectorizable in the sense that it can be vectorized because the reduction so on. But the the the, the size of STD string class actually plays a model, and there is like certain the size of class string is somewhere that it's maybe not memory inefficient efficient because the, you have this SD strength string which is 32 bytes and then you access like only eight bytes or four bytes so it's like uh, something in the middle probably the compiler would not probably vectorize this but you should check you can force it okay so yes Yes, yes, yes. When something is memory intensive, that then it vectorizing it does not pay off. You will see, like, I think that I, I'm not sure what happened, but actually, think when you uh, the CPU instead of executing four instructions with vectorization, it executes once, but it has to wait for all four loads to finish before it can say this instruction is done. And that's why scale code actually can be faster than vectorized. Okay, yes. But like going back to the example. Depending on the hardware, I would imagine that unrolling the loop to have to be like wider would allow it to access more, like have to fill the load queue more efficiently than having to wait for like each iteration because then it has to like change the program counter like when it comes to each iteration and it can't like exploit instruction level parallels to the same degree. Separate the internal so we'll talk about instruction parallelism a bit later, but the CPU can issue loads in parallel here because the loads are independent. It cannot add them together, but it can issue them in parallel. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like unrolling might be beneficial, like why the compiler might want to unroll this. I'm not sure about that. I wouldn't I wouldn't bet on that. Especially this would not most certainly vectorize on all on like on neon because neon doesn't have these gather instructions. And you need this gather because you have a class string, but only you're accessing one part, and the rest you're just wasting wasted memory transfers. You don't access it. Okay. Uh, okay. What are the fixes for vectorization problems? It will be to go look at the compiler optimization report. Punk has a good one. 
and then it will tell you what you need to do and how to vectorize. Many loops that first don't vectorize, when you look at the vectorization compilation report and you play a bit, they do vectorize and you will see like a spike increase in speed improvement. Compilers cannot vectorize all loops and there are certain loops, certain patterns that compilers normally never do. One is this four loops with breaks or while loops, like counting how the length of the string that things don't, don't vectorize the compiler, but can be vectorized manually. Also, for example, quick sort, merge sort, JSON parsing, their implementation, the vectorization implementation of many algorithms using SIMD, so they are really efficient. And this is the, how, how they typically strive for, 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 for that performance, yes? A very prominent example of quick sort, merge sort, and JSON parsing that are vectorized. Yes. Yes, manual. Manual, net, no, no, not the compiler. It was okay. manual vectorization. That's the key, the key thing there. Yes? Do you have a preference between uh, uh, compiler interfaces vectorization algorithms or something like uh, OMT, SIMD? So I played with compiler, uh, compiler optimizations and I played with uh, Highway by Google. <laughs> and um, compiler are lower level. And uh, the good thing about compiler optimization is you have like a direct control and you see, you can look at the inter intrinsics guide and you know for, but when you're using highway, you don't know exactly, you have some guesses, but you don't know exactly what's going on. But highway works with template types, so it's really usable in, in case you use templates. So that, that's, I think, the, the biggest thing about it. But they're like, they're like codes that you have actors in my, one way in Neon and another way in, in uh, AVX. So in my one way, on, R and another way in x86, so it's not really truly portable, but this is mostly portable. So, but there are certain types that, that you need to write differently with highway on x86 and on RAM. Okay. Uh, questions? Yeah. Yes. Do you know of the standard implementation or the standard library because those implementations are sufficient for? Yeah, uh, no, no, that's a really complicated question. So uh, uh, you you will always find online like faster implementation of STD, so faster implementation of binary trees. So they're not they're optimized in the sense for common cases, but they're not like the fastest. For example, this is now like a rent, but uh, originally in the STD map or STD set are internally the trees. But they were divided in the 90s. Now, in nowadays, you would much you would be much better off if you had trees which are not binary, but like three or four or five members. So, ternary, quaternary, quinternary. What's the name for it? You would be much be better now from a memory efficiency. But it was set up in the 90s, and because of the of the of the and you have much because of the sorry. It was set up in the 90s because of the um, you need to be backward compatible, so you cannot change it anymore. But if you take another instruction, a data structure that uses internally these larger, larger and shallower trees, they are more hardware efficient. Yes. Uh -huh. We'll talk about later that about that. Okay. I don't want. To, no. We have yes. It's a question. Um, the thing about the impact of development. And that we know that something can be vectorized, what's the best way of use of the time? Try to push the compiler to also vectorize it or to go directly with intrinsics? I would prefer first to try the compiler because it's simpler and of course it's more maintainable. For example, with that matrix, uh, with that matrix interchange we saw, the original code was not vectorized, but after that transformation it was vectorized. It was vectorized because the compiler had a good memory access pattern. So you could vectorize like that. And then the first thing you should try with the compiler, don't try, don't write intrinsics unless you have to. It's because it's really messy. That codes are that codes are awful. Okay. Uh, more questions. Okay. Uh, let's make a break, five minutes. So don't be long. Have water. Uh, go to the toilet, and in five minutes we continue. Okay. Okay, let's continue. So it's late and uh, we have one, this is only half of the talk, we have another half. One question from, from the internet. Uh -huh. the answer is Why is the name memory intensive? I thought CPU's prefetch constant stride accesses too. 
Yeah, but they prefetch it. You will see in this talk why is it nano intensive, okay? It will still be very faster. <laughs> I don't know, measure it, but it will be faster. I, I can guarantee it will be faster. It has to do with cache lines, but let's let's uh, let's uh, let's uh, let's uh, I'll answer that later, okay? Okay, so optimizing memory intensive codes. I already told you that CPUs are much faster than memory, and CPUs are many times data starved. So all the resources are there, but data is not there, and you cannot do anything with them. So the solution is data cache memories. Uh, data cache memories are small memories on the CPU, which are fast. Access to them is fast. Uh, data, if the piece of data is the data in the data cache, then the access to it is fast. If the piece of data which is not in the data cache, then the access to it is slow. And many pro pro programs, especially if they have large classes, and this typically happens if an object-oriented paradigm, will be memory intensive. So because they process large classes, and you will see why that matters. Now, if we as developers are aware of how memory subsystem works, we can make we can profit from that and we can exploit that to our advantage. So, what types of memory uh, operations in your code decrease memory efficiency? So, anytime you access some data through a pointer uh, or through a reference, but mo mostly pointers because references don't happen in like in vectors. Every time you access uh, through a pointer, you potentially has a you have potentially random memory access. You access something somewhere on the somewhere in the memory, not always. But many times, okay. So if you have classes with unique pointers, basic uh, raw pointers, unique pointers, whatever, and you access those data, you are the referencing pointers. If you have heap allocated objects, you are the referencing pointers. If you have a vector of pointers, and this happens a lot with polymorphism, you are the referencing pointers, which do not necessarily neighboring pointers in the vector do not necessarily point to the neighboring neighboring uh, uh, memory addresses, okay. Again, this is related to pointer access. Second thing is you have a, 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 a array and you perform random memory accesses in the array. So unpredictable memory accesses. So this one, one of this type, it's called with data gathers and scatters. This is data scatter. So it scatters data sent in randomly. When we are accessing this array histogram in an unpredictable way. Next, binary search. You have binary search, you got the middle, the middle, the middle, but these are all random accesses. And generally, the lookup algorithms that are looking up things are memory intensive, and the processing algorithms are generally computation intensive because the processing algorithm will typically call data in, in arrays. Next, all everything that has to do with binary trees, linked lists, and hash maps has potential to be memory intensive. Heap sort. So when you are keeping a binary tree in a, in array is also memory intensive because you are jumping you you have this random memory accesses. What increases memory efficiency? So if you are iterating through an array or vector sequentially, the smaller class, the smaller the class, that means the higher data cache hit rate, the better memory efficiency of a program. Ideally, what is ideal is that you have a good class, you have members of your class. And you're accessing your hot loop, which is an important loop in your code, is exiting all the members. This is a perfect uh, usage of the memory subsystem. If you're accessing some members but not accessing others, you're leaving something out. Okay. Next thing is what is accessed together should be close neighbors in memory. So this is why like you have two data members in class that you often access together. You should declare them in class. So the compiler will put them in memory one after another. Also, for example, if you have linked lists and you're accessing, you're traversing the linked lists, if those chunks of memory, nodes, representing nodes, if they're neighbors in memory, the same way they're uh, logically neighbors in linked lists, this will also influence positive performance. Okay, what are the hardware things that impl the influence software performance? First, the data cache size. We already mentioned that. Small binary trees are faster to look up than large binary trees, and so on. Next thing that's also important is eviction policy. So what's eviction? The data cache size has a limited size. That means there is not enough room for everyone. So somebody needs to leave when somebody new comes. Who will leave? What piece of data will leave? Is the piece of data that was least recently used. That's the oldest one. That's been sitting there for longest. 
but not touched, yes? This was the model, like, for the last five, last few years. Uh -huh. not using a lot of but they, they use it some kind of thing. They use something, but it's not everything. Okay, okay, but it's something along those lines. They are not the, removing the 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 the, 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 the least reused. Okay, for sure. Complex. Okay. Next thing is cache line size. So what's cache line size? Uh, data is brought from the memory to the data caches, not uh, in single bytes, but in blocks, and each block is 64 bytes in size. So what happens is when the piece of data comes from the memory to the, uh, to the data caches, these are 64 bytes of continuous data. And for memory efficiency, you want, to cons you want your program to consume all of them. You don't want to use some of them and then just discard, not, not use. Perfectly, ideally, uh, ideally efficient program would consume everything. And that's why the sequential memory access pattern has 100% cache utilization layered, and that is why it's really efficient. Stride in memory access when you're jumping, they, they fetch. What happens is that in the that case that you're fetching that cache line 64 bytes, but you're accessing only one part of it, let's say eight bytes, and the rest of them are wasted transfers. And finally, prefetching. Uh, what's prefetching is a CPU can, it has a special hardware component, the prefetcher, it can detect the memory access pattern of your program. And it can prefetch the data before the instructions that will issue it is even issued. That uses the data is even issued. And sequential memory accesses and strident memory accesses are predictable, so the compiler can fetch the data faster. Okay. Uh, next, increasing memory efficiency. Questions? Okay. So the first thing you want to um, um, to increase uh, um, to uh, to speed up uh, uh, things is to avoid loads and storage instruction completely. So if, if that's the way how to do it, and that, that's also possible. One of the things that you should actually do is you have two loops which are neighbors and they iterate over the same data set. If you fuse them, you will get one loop that each iterates over the same data set and decreases the numbers of loads or stores. And C++ ranges actually generalize this. So the, with ranges, you're just uh, uh, chaining algorithms, but uh, everything happens while the data is in register. Ideally, it happens while the data is in registers. The data, the algorithms are applied, but the data never leaves the registers. And that's the reason why you with C++ ranges, you will see that compared to the STL things, when you, have, you need these intermediate buffers, the ranges are often faster. Okay, so, Loop fusion. Uh, okay, so I did some experiments here, and I measured uh, two loops: one looking for minimum, one looking for maximum. 16 bytes of class size, 100 million elements in the vector. The min min max in the same loop was 270 second, 207 seconds. The separate loops was 368. And the reason is bad because you're reusing data that is already in the registers, and you decrease the instruction count. You increase also this is also the number of times you're passing over the same data. And in Estra, we have STD min max. Okay, next thing you want to do is change the data access pattern. Okay, so this happens a lot when you're working with algorithms, when you have algorithms that work with matrices. So linear algebra, image processing, so on. Uh, you don't change the data layout, which is really important because when you change the data layout, that has influence all over your program. And you change the data access pattern that is limited only to that part of the code. Loop interchange, as explained earlier, was one of the extreme techniques that actually changes the type of, of but there are also others. One is the loop tiling, I'll explain it in the next slide, and loop sectioning. Uh, we don't talk about this today, but let's 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 explain loop tiling. So here's a here's our test code. For this one, I don't have runtime runtimes, it's from the Intel side. Uh, so there are two nested loops, and it iterates over matrices A and B. A is that iterated row-wise, and B is iterated column-wise. And then we perform, loop. we cannot do loop interchange here, we cannot exchange them because nothing changes. Then if we do that, only A goes row-wise and B goes column-wise. So what we should do, we call it loop blocking. We break this, this original problem into smaller. Now we have we are iterating over let's say small matrices. They have smaller size, and because of that, 
they fit the they fit the fastest caches, and that's the reason why this technique actually works. In my measurement, I did, didn't do measurement with this example. I did with matrix multiplication, but about loop tiling version was in my case like two times faster. And this is like the next step when you optimize map matrix multiplication. This is the second step. Loop interchange is the first. The loop tiling is the second because you're reusing the data before it leaves the cache. So row-wise accesses have a good cache line for uh, utilization. Column-wise accesses, they don't have a, ca a good cache line utilization, okay? Column-wise accesses, because when you read the first, let's say you're going column-wise, you're accessing row zero, but with the, 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 the column zero, you get the column one, two, and three. Because they belong to the same case, same case line. You, you get that access is really cheaply. But because the column is long, that data will get evicted. It will go away. And when you decrease the size of the column, that you're increasing chances that that piece of data remains in in in, in that in 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 the data cache. Uh, okay. Questions. Oh, yes. I want to make a question about the uh, sync as well about this one, but let's say that I optimize my job um, better. Uh -huh. Are there any tools that can prevent regressions that some analysts in the world to trade this optimization rate? Yeah. Uh, aha, you need to. I don't know if there are tools like for that. Uh, you need to have a functionality test and you need to have some kind of performance testing in your. There is no like a tool that will detect this. I'm not aware of it. There is one tool called Codee, it's called, that can like analyze the code and recommend recommend you this, uh, recommend you like do loop tiling, do loop interchange. Okay. Uh, do loop tiling, do loop interchange, but there is no, there is no, uh, there is no like for testing tool, I'm not aware of it. Okay. So next is the quiz. So consider the following. You have N image processing algorithms. And they form like this image processing pipeline. And input image goes to the algorithm zero, then to the algorithm one, to the algorithm through, and through all the other algorithms. So the output of algorithm X is the input of algorithm X plus one. So the algorithm X takes a full input, full image, does some processing, and it generates the output. And this output is fed to the next, next algorithm in the pipeline. So what is the problem with this approach? Loop fusion is not the problem, that's the solution. <laughs> yes, you're processing over the data time multiple times. Now, there is a the problem uh, with image processing is sometimes, oftentimes, you need this pixel, but you need to also surrounding pixels. So loop fusion is not always possible. Loop fusion is the best because uh, in that case, your data never leave registers, so you don't have loads in stores, and that's the perfect solution, but not always possible. But Another solution next to loop fusion is that similar to loop tiling is that you process one segment of the image in an algorithm, just a small one that fits the fast cache, and then pass that one to the next algorithm and pass that next one to the and so you're processing in these segments. And the good thing about this is that this this data never leaves the R1 cache, the fastest level of cache. Um, this actual technique is called kernel fusion, and there is a language, it's called Halid. That you can use to write these kind of codes that uh, tell that, they want, that you want data processing, but you want like working on these sections. And this technique is when when you are doing like this, that you are preventing data from leaving the fastest cache. It's called loop sectioning. So it actually has a name. Okay, questions? Okay. Uh -huh. No, it's not fit plus plus. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we talked about most of the things that we talked about until now that do not require changes in data layout. But when you're doing with memory intensive code, sometimes you need to change the data layout. And we saw that structure of arrays that we explained earlier was an example of changing the, the data layout. So uh, what's data layout? There is memory layout and data layout. Data layout is determined by the compiler at compiler time. And memory layout is determined by the allocator at runtime, okay? I make these distinctions important for me. So how do you change the data layout? What can you do? What are the techniques? First is decrease the class size. 
the, the smaller the, size, the class size, so ideally what you want is actually to access all the data from the, all the members of the class. That means you're not wasting any any cash, uh, you're not wasting any any cash, uh, any memory bandwidth. Everything that comes from the C memory to the CPU is consumed. And this will typically mean that you will, from this class, you will remove unused members and access, or you will move in members from other classes. You can also move in, you can increase the data class size. That's fine, but it's important that you access everything. And the extreme of that is structure of arrays. That's an extreme. So you don't need to go that far, not necessarily. Structure of arrays will actually maintain the enable vectorization. That's why it's important, but not necessarily, necessarily always. And actually, I don't know if you're uh, if you're familiar with that. Uh, the it's called uh, data oriented design in games development. And one of the main things that they do is they 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 uh, they um, think about how to organize classes, and they often insist that the classes should be small and each class held in a separate vector. And this is what they do. And one what happens is behind the background is that the memory uh, memory um, memory, uh, uh, God, it escapes me. The memory uh, utilization. So the memory subsystem utilization becomes becomes high. So this is what happens behind the background, and why this approach actually works, although nobody knows how to use it. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. The experiments with class size and member layout, and this is what I got. So uh, it was a class that's in a vector. So and when the, I changed the class size from the smallest to the largest, and this is how the graph looks like. So it grows, it grows, and then it leads some kind of uh, some kind of limitation. And I think we, even Klaus Weller, I read, I didn't read the whole book, but I read part of it. And one of the important things for performance, but also for maintainability, is you do this class decomposition well. So you should. You should not have like whole world classes which has everything in it, especially not processes that kind of classes. So why is processing the smaller classes faster? Because it has cache and utilization better. Everything that comes from memory to the to the data caches is actually consumed, and this this makes all the difference. Um, okay, so this was about changing the data layout, and now let's talk about data structure layout. So with some data structures like linked list, binary, uh, binary trees, and so on, you can change the data structure layout. And here, you see on the right, it's called unrolled linked list, and they're faster than regular linked list. And the reason is quite simple. Again, better cache line utilization. You get 64 megabytes of uh, 64 megabytes of data from the memory to the memory to the data caches, and look, you get three values instead of one. Especially because it decreases the pointer, uh, the pointer um, portion. We had one pointer per three elements or four elements instead of one pointer per one element. The same applies to the binary trees. If you increase the size of the tree, like we have tree with four floats instead of one in a node, especially then you can use SIMD to process four nodes in parallel, and this also increases the speed of processing. Okay, next thing is changing the memory layout. So memory layout is how the system allocator, system allocator, uh, how the system allocator, so you, when you ask malloc, you get the memory chunk. It's somewhere in memory, it has an address, and it is compared to other chunks and the way you access memory, it, it builds some kind of data structure. So it builds some text, there is a certain pattern to it. Now, memory fragmentation is closely related to bad memory layout, but it's also to decrease in, in performance of memory accesses. When your your memory is fragmented a lot, that means there are more random accesses, and, and that means that it is it is uh, these accesses are slower. That's for example when you there is a system level allocator is like TC malloc or me malloc, and when you exchange the allocator, instead of using glibc allocator, you use TC malloc for example. You get better performance for two reasons. One is that the malloc and trees are faster, the implementation. But another one is that the memory accesses are also faster because there is less memory fragmentation. Okay. So the importance of memory layout. How do you modify memory layout? You need a custom allocator, custom implementation of malloc and tree, and they can be either 
instance of your class. Let's say you have a huge binary tree, which is like 100 megabytes, and then you have an allocator for just that instance of a binary tree. That makes sense. Now, sometimes like strings, each string class have, makes at most one allocator call to the malloc. So in that case, it doesn't make sense to have allocator per, per class. It makes sense to have allocator per type. And then you can use overwrite as to the allocator. And finally, you can change the global memory allocator. Now, one of the things that somebody mentioned, I think it was you, Lucas, right? Is flat data structures. So what flat data, you, it was you. So flat data structure means that the data structure uh, is allocated in one block of memory, which is really compact. There is no holes in the middle. Everything is there is used. And the reasons why this is, it decreases, uh, this is better because it de decreases the memory fragmentation, or everything is local, and typically flat uh, data structures are faster. And this was, I think, discovered like by accident when they implemented flat buffers, and they figured out when you deserialize something, it's faster than the original data structure. Okay, I have example here of linked list memory layout, and there are three memory layouts here. So one is called the random memory layout, the second one is called the compact memory layout, and the third one is called the perfect memory layout. So with random, the nodes are just randomly scattered in the memory. With compact, uh, you have that they are the nodes are inside this compact block of memory. It's like a flat data structure. And finally, in perfect memory layout, what you have is that if they're neighbors logically in the linked list, they're also neighbors in memory. Oh, this linked list has six examples, but I did a test on that one, and these are the numbers. So when the linked list is really small, the memory layer doesn't matter, it's all the same. But when it's really large, the random takes 15 seconds and the compact 9.7 and the perfect 0 0.12. Now you can't, you know, you understand quite logically that perfect layout does not come cheap and maintaining a perfect layout can be really complex and sometimes it's not worthwhile but you need to be aware of these numbers okay so the perfect memory layout why is it faster again the cache time utilization is the fastest uh, the best because everything you get from the memory actually use and the second thing is that you have the prefetching mechanism can be activated because the memory access pattern is actually predictable. Okay, here again we have a quiz. So we have binary tree here. Okay, this is the Luca binary tree. It has a root and it has nodes. It has four levels, and it is stored in memory. And we have four memory layouts. First one is called BFS, breadth search. So we have 10, then 5, 14, the second level, then 3, 7, 12, 18, the third level, and then we have the fourth level, okay? So this is the first. The second one is DFS layout. So we have 10, 5, 3, 1, we go left, and when we cannot go for the left, we go right. So 10, 5, 3, 1, and then we have 4. Then we have 7, 6, 9, 12, 11, 13, 18, 16, 19. So this is the DFS layout. The third one is called one MD Boas layout. So how does it look one? The, the third one. We have like 10, 5, and 14 are one block. The next one is 3, 1, 4. It's the second block. The next one is 7, 6, 9. It's the third block. 12, 11, 3. So the group of three nodes, one is the parent and two other children are stored together. Now, what do you think? Which is the faster, which is the slowest, and why? Sorry, so the lookup is just, so this is the tree, the lookup, uh, it's looking up uh, value if it exists in the tree or not. So can you repeat which one, which one is, which one is the fastest? One end. One end, okay. And this is the reason is why, because? Because you decide which side to go, uh -huh. next level. And then you go to this side, and if you decide for left, you go only to the left, and this is the same cache line. Yeah, so both the left child and the right child are with high probability in the same cache line. Yes. Random is probably the slowest. And what about BFS and DFS? BFS should also be faster because it's in a context. The first version are completely 
So just think about think about neighbors. What is access together should be neighbors in memory. That's the idea that should you should have in your head when you think about these things. Which one is the better, VFS or DFS? Yeah, you should. I would expect it to be faster because with DFS the left is always neighbor. With one F day it's both. But you can be only limited to three nodes, so three nodes, a group of three nodes. But with VFS, the left one is always neighbor. If you take any of these, let's say you take five, the three is neighbor. If you have seven, the sixth one is neighbor. Okay, and that's why it's faster. And we did measurement here, and with two different allocators, one is the test the allocator, and one the other one is like the perfect allocator, which is like a really simple gradation replacing the test the allocator, which doesn't have the the allocator uh, is metadata allocator, and you see that DFS is 11.2, DFS is 7.2, and one of the boas is 6.4. Okay. Yes. Does it matter for one of the how many nodes you cluster to one? Do you understand what happens? Can you can you what happens with one of the boas layer? Do you understand what happens like on the on the higher level on the like the guard level? What it converts it to what? One M the boss. What is it equivalent to? It's grouping them together. Yes, but it's equivalent to uh, with one M the boss line, it's like you created it's a binary tree, it has uh, instead of having one node, it has three nodes in a single uh, three values in a single node. So it's like uh, it's like uh, you did uh, instead of having binary tree, you have a, a ternary quaternary tree, right? The logic, I mean, from what 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 happened with one and the boss layer, and actually, if you if you should use paternal trees, you would get something similar. Even paternal trees are better because they have less. You don't need pointers going from the root because you know that you know where they are. So the the, the these trees with which which bigger number of, of of values in a single node are actually more efficient. They consume less space. They they consume less space. Okay. Questions? The coloring is misleading and then you have S9 for the fourth. Is it? For the fourth, then you have S9. Yeah, you're right. Sorry. Yes, it is. Okay. Okay, this finished the memory optimizations. I didn't cover everything, but they covered enough. We can get started. I think that's that's good enough. Uh, how much time do we have? 15 minutes. Okay, that's enough. The last thing is instruction level parallelism. Okay, so what, what is instruction level parallelism? So modern CPUs can execute more than a, a single instruction in a cycle. In a cycle, they can execute four, uh, let's say four, maybe five, two, depends on the architecture. But it's not the only thing. Many CPUs, desktop and servers, can execute instructions out of order. You don't need to, they, you can execute the instruction that comes later in the instruction stream before another instruction. And the true bottlenecks when it comes to what you can execute and what you cannot execute are instruction dependencies. So you can execute instruction if you have the data needed for that instruction, which are, that is already calculated by previous instructions. So this is instruction dependencies. So uh, uh, it can only an instruction can execute only if all of its input values are ready uh, and the instruction level parallelism is that you can create a CPU which has as many resources as you want, but it won't be faster if there is a lot of instruction level parallelism. If every instruction depends on the previous instruction, this is like the perfect chain of instruction level parallelism uh, of uh, instruction dependency. That co code has really low instruction level parallelism and doesn't profit a lot from all the CPU resources that you have in your, at your disposal. Okay. Now, instruction level parallelism, I don't know if there's any metrics that will tell you this code has high, this code has low. I saw there is a tool, but I didn't try it, but it's definitely not mainstream. How much can your code profit from available hardware resources? If it has a lot of, if your code has a lot of instruction level parallelism, it can profit a lot. If it has little, it will profit little from all the resources that you have at your disposal. 
Okay, so if you have a loop with the loop carrying dependency, most likely you are instruction level parallelism bound. So this is the, the boundary. The instruction, the loop, when you need data from the previous in, in, iterations, then, then it means that you're bound by this, by the instruction level parallelism. Okay, now here is the loop that kept C of phi equals A of phi plus B of phi. And I wrote here that it has high instruction level parallelism. Uh, why does it have high instruction level parallelism? Imagine you have a machine that has infinite resources. How much time would this take to compute? One cycle, exactly. So you can do all loads from zero to one in parallel in one cycle. In the next cycle, you do all the adds. In the next cycle, you store it, and so three cycles, let's say, but it's a constant number of cycles, okay? So it has high instruction level parallelism. CPU can actually, uh, can execute many instructions in advance because there are no instruction dependencies. This loop has medium instruction level parallelism. So why do you call it medium? It's equivalent to STD. So this one is STD transform, and STD transform actually has a, all loops that can be written as STD transform have a lot of instruction level parallelism. With STD reduce, you have less. So we have a loop that sums all the element of some array A of I. Now, how much time would this need to execute? So you're limited by a number of, uh, so in the past, I know what you're thinking in your head. It has log of n, but it's not like that because the hardware cannot do it like that. It cannot do that kind of optimization on the fly. So what you can do actually, you can perform all loads, all data loading in one in one cycle. But the summing you need to do it, it the summing you need to do, you need to, to do sequentially. So it's actually n. So in n cycles, you can do. You just need one cycle to load everything, but you need to do summing sequentially. Of course, if you know that the summing is associative and it, it will commute, commutative, right? Then you can shorthand that, but the CPU does not know that and it cannot do that. Okay, and finally, you have a low instructional level parallelism. So here you have an example of uh, summing of values in a linked list. So it's equivalent of STD reduced on a linked list. And what happens here is that in order to load from the current iteration data you need, you need to finish loading on the previous one. So there is, in the, the previous example, there was a chain of dependencies, but only on additions, not on loads. And here we have also the chain of dependencies of loads. And this code has really low instructionality parallelism. It is latency bound. It, it, almost no instruction can be executed in parallel because it needs to wait for the previous one. Okay, now what kind of codes? This code is called pointer chasing because in order to find the address of the next element, you need to Calculate the current one and linked lists and binary trees actually chase pointers. And these codes they typically have low instruction level uh, parallelism. And the problem, the biggest problem you get is when you have uh, uh, dependencies in memory loads, not dependencies in calculations, but dependencies in memory loads because loads are actually nowadays the slowest instructions. The most instruction executed in one cycle, but loads executed in three, even when, when it's fastest. So how can you improve instruction level parallelism in your code? There are two techniques. One is breaking dependency chains, and the second one is called interleaving dependency chains. So let's go through them. Breaking dependencies. It's more difficult. It requires some kind of redesign and rethinking of your code, where that actually you're getting rid of, uh, you're getting rid of the pointer chains. So one of the examples is to use in array tree instead of pointer tree. So you can calculate the address by using arithmetics instead of loads. And this code is actually faster. So tree stored in an array that can be accessed. I did an experiment. I took a tree stored it in an array, but I also created a pointer. So you can access it either using arithmetics like this one, two times x plus one, two times x plus two, or you can access it through pointers. So the data structure is identical, and you get something like this. So while the binary tree is small, it doesn't matter, but when it grows about a certain limit, when it doesn't fit the, the, the fastest cache anymore, then you see that the Array space run times are faster. Okay. Uh, you can also shorten uh, dependency chains, and that happens when you have the linked lists, uh, unrolled linked lists, which holds four instead of one element, they hold four. So you have four times less pointers. 
if we have a link place that in one node holds four values instead of one, then the number of pointer chains is shorter, and if you have less pointer dependencies, this also increases instruction level parallelism available for those data structures. Okay, next thing is you can interleave dependency chains. So imagine if you have a dependency chain, then you take another dependency chain and you run them together. So interleave them. You run a little bit from one, a little bit from another one, and you do it like that. For example, you can process four linked lists instead of one. That's one, one way to do it. But you need to have additional data structures. So interleaving is possible, not always possible. You need to have additional data structures. So again, I did the experiment here, and I performed end parallel lookups in a binary tree. So what normally, when you do a binary tree lookup, you want to check if the value is in the binary tree. What you do is you go to root, then you go left, right, left, right, until you reach that leaf where you don't find anything. And this is the standard way of doing it. And parallel lookups, they look a bit different. So you're performing lookups in parallel for n values. So the n values, like the, let's say you have n values that you want to look up, you don't do it one by one. You will do all of them in parallel. So if you allocate the, uh, one one uh, uh, vector called current nodes that stores the current node for each of the n values that you're looking up, and then in loop you go through this and uh, uh, you go through this. Um, oh God. <laughs> You go through these n values and then you're checking if the current node is not no pointer. That means you still have some processing to do. And then you check if the values of i is less, greater or equal, and calculate the result. And you repeat that several times. So you're doing parallel lookups. Am I clear now? Because I don't have, is this clear what I'm saying? Other people, because the code is a bit messy, so it's not it's not like example code. But these are the numbers. So these are the numbers. So when it's small, it doesn't matter much. But when it's large, then you see that the interleaved version is much faster because it has much more available instruction level parallelism. I think we reached the end of tonight's talk. So you saw what the hyper efficiency means and how it can be achieved, and I hope this will. I hope this was an uh, interesting lecture to you. So let me just introduce myself now. So I do this kind of things a lot. And if you have like software performance problems or you need performance trainings, I do that as well. And uh, yeah, this is the things that I'm, this is my expert domain, the main of expertise. And that's it. Any questions? Yes. So if you are lucky in iterating to erase sequentially in parallel, if they happen to be exactly the right to uh, distance in memory from each other, each read from one array would overwrite the cache line of the other one. Yeah, that's related to cache conflicts. Uh, but we don't have time to cover that. That's like uh, there's certain certain things that happen in hardware that uh, I would call like uh, um, extreme behavior or unwanted behavior, and crash crash conflicts are one of them. Uh, I don't. I did some experiments with Valgrind. It's really difficult to detect cases with cache conflicts, but this was an introductory talk. That does happen, but it doesn't happen a lot. For example, the, what you're explaining is when you have binary storage, you often have a lot of cache conflicts if the size of the array is a power of two. And then because you're always dividing by two, the, 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 the access pattern is always uh, uh, divided by two, by two, by two, and they always fit the same data cache line. Okay, more questions? Okay, can we read the online questions? I, I, the talk was long, but I hope we have, it was interesting to you, uh, and I hope it was nice. Uh, it, normally, this would be two talks, but I'm in Munich for one day, so I can come again. <laughs> no questions. Okay. Thank you very much for attending, and hope to see you.